This is what really got me started on downtown Credo was this realization that somebody somewhere needed to raise the banner that our quality of life is more tied to who we're becoming than what we have. Our quality of life is more tied to who we're becoming than what we have. And so we just decided four and a half years ago that if we become people of meaning, impact, and community, then no matter how much stuff we have, we'll like our lives better. Right? Interesting thing happened when uh, we started saying that, we got a lot of knowing nods. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Our quality of life is more tied to who we're becoming than what we have. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like that. I thought people would be surprised because it didn't seem like we were making decisions based on that. And so I started asking, why is it that the natural momentum of our lives carries us towards um, entertainment, isolation, bigger homes, newer cars, bigger TVs, right? Why is it that the natural momentum of our lives carries us that way? And one of the ideas is that um, there's a momentum that builds up in an economy. So um, it's not true that, um, uh, that income is always inversely related to happiness. They've actually tried to figure it out, and they've decided as they map GDPs at per capita income and happiness, they realize that the more income produces greater happiness up into a threshold of per capita income. Can you guess what the per capita income is? 70, 75,000. Any other guesses? 60,000. 40,000. Happiness uh, is directly related to per capita income up to $10,000 a household. After that, the direct correlation starts to fall apart. That's nuts, right? <laughs> Up until about your GDP, your per capita income for a country, looking at it as a whole, your per capita income, once it reaches $10,000 per capita, there is no longer a direct correlation between income and life satisfaction. It starts to kind of get wonky. I imagine if we went down and looked at um, individuals and asked that on an individual basis rather than on a national basis, that number would probably go up a little bit if you think about it. As I tried to ask myself, is that, is that square with my experience, the notion that, um, that happiness with life is no longer directly proportionate to income after $10,000 per capita? I thought of this story. When we go down to get coffee, I've only been once. We, we send a team every year, but it's kind of a crazy trip to go to where our friends are that grow coffee. Plane to Miami, plane to Guatemala City, plane to uh, um, the Quiche region up in the mountains of Guatemala. And then from there, the back of a pickup truck. And from the back of the pickup truck, we're riding. By now, half of the people speak Hispanic and half speak Ishil, like native dialects, right? Um, there's no running water in some places, definitely no sewage. You're bringing clean drinking water stuff because they're drinking out of the mountain water a lot of times. You have to bring things to help them get clean drinking water. We go to around to six different villages and visit the guys, some of the guys that we're buying coffee from there. We pay them directly, as directly as we can. There's a group of people that live there full time and build their relationships with them. But the story that came to mind is I thought, does this issue of per capita income uh, falling apart from a direct correlation after $10,000 square with my experience was a story of a guy that I met there. And for the life of me, I can't remember his name. But we were in a little town called Las Brisas. And he had kids with him. And he was about my age. And, um, and the homes there are kind of rough. A lot of them don't have uh, poured floors. They just have dirt floors and corrugated tin roofs. You know, you've seen. But he had a two-story cement block home with tile on the floor. And he was like my age. And he had kids with him. And he was happy. And so through my friend Stephen, who speaks Spanish, and I'm one lingual American. I don't know what you'd call a one lingual person, but that's me. Uno lingual. 
so through my friend Stefan, I am able to have a conversation with the guy, and I find out the reason he's got a nice house is because he's made a couple trips to Florida and uh, picked tomatoes across city, shipped all the money home, and built this house. He'd like to come back and get some more, but it was too dangerous at the time to cross the border. Too many people dying trying to cross the border. I realized, okay, up to a certain point, income makes your life better, right? Some time ago, you and I crossed that point. Some time ago, you and I crossed that point, right? Where was it? This is how economies build up a momentum, right, that gets it to where in the large and small decisions, though we know intellectually our quality of life is more tied to who we're becoming than what we have, for the life of us, we just want a Mazda 3. We just want a bigger TV, a bigger house, a nicer car. The problem is, it doesn't make us any happier than the Pennsylvania Dutch, Amish, sorry, Pennsylvania Amish, who are driving their horse and buggy and in the house that they built with their own hands. Our quality of life must be tied to something else. And so we just decided that it's tied to meaning, impact, and community. And this is where the minimalism stuff comes in, right? Because I think that a dose of minimalism would produce lives that we like better. And I was thinking about, like, I don't know if this is right or not, but my idea of minimalist design is a lot of empty space, right? And then, like, something, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I was thinking, the first time that you look at uh, something designed with a lot of empty space and then nothing or something, you think, well, there's a lot of nothing and then something. But then it occurs to me that if you're creating that piece, you don't have a lot of nothing by accident. You're trying to say something with the nothing that's there. And so then I realized the idea of minimalism is only half of the equation. You don't get to minimalism by deciding to not be something. You're making an intentional choice to be something else. And it pushes out the other stuff. And so that's where I say, if you and I, in a, in a maximalist culture, want a dose of minimalism in order that we might like our lives better, the answer is not to just try and get rid of stuff. It's to decide who we'd like to become. See, because you are in the water of a maximalist culture. It will, if you do nothing, it will drive you towards bigger houses, nicer cars, bigger TVs, Right? You'll pull into your house, you'll shut the garage door, and you'll sit down on your couch that always seems to grow every couple of years. Your couch gets bigger to compensate for the bigger TV. If you do nothing, that's what will happen. And so you and I, if we want a dose of minimalism in our life that we might like our lives better, we have to decide what we value and who we want to be more than stuff. So if you want a dose of minimalism, you need to decide what you value and pick that over the stuff that will kind of encroach in and take over. That's it.